Um, I think, you know, we need to be mindful. Um, we're, we are in the midst of, uh, I would say organized chaos, but it's really not. I mean, it's just chaos. You know, we're living in a chaotic time um, in so many ways. And it's affecting all kinds of people. Um, it's affecting school system. It's affecting the parents. It's affecting our leaders. It's affecting everybody. There's nobody in our world that's unaffected by what's going on. And, uh, and so we need to be mindful of that. We need to be mindful that these are the moments when the gospel is needed. That the gospel doesn't somehow become less valuable. Uh, you know, this is not, uh, I'm stressed out because things are going all wrong, so I'm going to put the gospel on a shelf until it's comfortable again. This is the time when people who have shelved the gospel need it to be brought back out. And, and those of us, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, who are living out the gospel, come to their rescue. And so we need to be mindful that this is a, a ripe season for harvesting. And, you know, the Lord said uh, that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And so right now the harvest is plentiful, and it has been. So we need to be mindful of those things and mindful that uh, God calls us to be ambassadors for the gospel, even, uh, even while our lives are chaotic. Uh, because we know that even if our lives unravel to the very end, that we are not without hope. That if everything we have here passes away, we will step into the presence of God forever. And so that holds us, should hold us, steady in the midst of the storm. So before we get started, let's uh, spend a few moments praying uh, together. Lord Jesus, we love you. We know that you are our God. We know that you are the sovereign over all. We know that you hold all things together, that you have created all things, that you oversee them and hold them together. Lord, we know that you are working all things according to your perfect will. And even, Father, when we can't understand things or we think the world is unfolding in a way that's wrong or that's bad, and Father, even when it's, we are just confused and perhaps even tempted to be driven to despair, we're reminded of the words of Scripture that we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that you are all-powerful, not we. We are perplexed, but we are not despairing. Sometimes we are struck down, but we are not destroyed. So, Father, teach us to set our hopes upon you. Teach us to set our minds upon you. Lord, we pray for all of those who are laboring under heavy, unique burdens of the present hour. Remind us, Father, that we need you more than ever. We don't need you more now than we did before. But Father, sometimes our sense, our awareness of needing you is more acute in times like this. Father, teach us, motivate us to be heralds of the gospel wherever we go. Lord, we do pray for Bill, for Bill's family as he's passed on. Same with Coy. Lord, we pray that you would comfort their family, that you would be an ever-present help and a refuge. Your word tells us that you're near to the brokenhearted. Father, we pray for Allison's mother, Terry, as she prepares for her procedure. We pray that you'd watch over that and oversee those details. Father, as we turn now to your word, we pray that you would come and help us, that you would come and watch over both your word and perform it. Help us to see wonderful things. And Father, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. How many of y'all uh, routinely think about uh, your investments? Maybe you have a financial advisor, or a financial planner, or a life coach, or whatever. How many of you think about Stan uh, Stan and Linda? See, they're arguing about it right now. How? Uh, oh, all right. Fair enough. Fair enough. I think sometimes we can think about it often. Sometimes we can think about it uh, rarely. 
Uh, and sometimes we can isolate our thinking when we hear the word investment, we can think money. But investment can mean almost anything. It can mean time, resources, it can mean energy, it can mean attention, it can mean anything that we have to give. We invest it into something. And so as we are working our way through uh, these minor profits, and they're, why do we call them minor? Because they're short, right? They're not less important. Uh, as we've, we're working our way towards the end of the book of the 12, we only have two left after Haggai. But we come to Haggai, the second shortest book, just behind uh, Obadiah. He's only got two chapters. But Haggai asks us the question, what do your investments reveal? Because you, you can take someone's life and look at their checkbook, look at their, uh, their calendar, their schedule, and figure out pretty quickly what's important to them. Where does money go? Where does time go? Where do, what fills our lives? And, uh, you know, we could ask um, things like, what kind of cars do we drive? What kind of homes do we own? What kind of um, uh, cr- creature comforts do we have? Uh, you know, there are all kinds of things that reveal what's important to us. Now, we need to say right up front, it's not wrong to have money. It's not wrong to have things. It's not wrong to have a nice car. None of that is wrong in and of itself, but we are tempted as sinful creatures to trust in and to love our things rather than God. And we are tempted to invest in our things rather than in the things of God. And Haggai comes along and says, what do your investments reveal about you? What do they show you about your heart? What does your life say about who you are? So you can see there if you've got your notes. You might need notes. Anybody right, got notes? You need some notes. Um, do y'all want another one, Kim? Okay. So you can see there um, that Haggai comes along, and his ministry is pretty short. It's about four or five months long. Towards the end of uh, the year five, 20. And he's really the only prophet we can date with that kind of specificity because he kind of, he kind of describes the month and the year and who's in charge historically. So we can kind of pin down based on what he says when he comes along. So between August and December, Haggai preaches four times. Now he probably did some other things. You know, he probably ministered and had some conversations along the way, but his book is kind of made up of these four short sermons where he calls upon the people to recognize you're moving in a sinful direction and God's calling you to move in a godly direction. And it's kind of wrapped up around investments. The theme of the book, the, 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 kinda, the main idea that he's getting at is right worship, that the people uh, were not worshiping rightly. In fact, they were probably um, more close, so we could call them idolaters rather than right worshipers of God based on what they were doing. Um, and, and, and I hope you'll, you'll see that as we move through. But you can see there, under the purpose and the theme, Haggai calls upon his hearers, both then in Judah and now, to consider how they are spending their lives. Where are they investing their time and their resources? And what does that ultimately reveal about them? Now, sometimes we can come to the Bible and see other people very easily. Like we read this and somebody comes to our mind. But this is one of those books that if we will let it is a mirror where we see ourselves. Now that ought to be how we come to the Bible all the time. What is this saying about me? What is God revealing in my heart? What is he calling me to do? How is he calling me to be obedient? And Haggai comes along and holds up a mirror and says, look at yourself. Look at your life. What does it reveal. And so you can see the outline there. I won't spend time on that. Uh, Haggai is called a, is a post-exilic prophet is the kind of the fancy term for that. What that means is he comes along after the exile. If you remember the, the history, the movements of Judah or Israel's story, uh, once Saul and David are established as, as kings, they have the, the monarchy there, and it lasts until after Solomon, and then it's torn into two, Israel and Judah. 
Israel in the north, Judah in the south. Israel's exiled by Assyria. Judah's exiled by Babylon. And Jeremiah 29 tells us that they're gonna be there for 70 years and then God would bring them back. And so Haggai comes along after they've come back. So to help you maybe put some more of this together in your mind, um, if you remember when we were studying through the historical books, we came to Ezra and Nehemiah. And Ezra and Nehemiah both led Jews from Babylon back to Jerusalem and oversaw the building of the wall and uh, they rediscovered the law, if y'all remember that. That in Nehemiah we find that Nehemiah 8, that great text where uh, the, the law is read from sun up to midday and they just stand there and hear it, which is why I'm going to preach for several hours tonight, all right? But they read this, and Leslie's like, okay, I did not know. Um, but Ezra and Nehemiah, that story, those books, happen at the same time as Haggai. And Haggai shows up by name in Ezra. So he's talking about the rebuilding of the temple, and, he, and his ministry occurs kind of on top of. And so he comes along after the exile, the people have come back, and he is preaching about rebuilding the temple. So, um, during, uh, just before the exile, if you remember, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, comes into Jerusalem, into Judah, and lays siege to Jerusalem for several years, cuts them off, and waits them out. And um, once Jerusalem fell to Nebuchadnezzar, they tore down all the walls, almost all the walls, and burned the temple to the ground, burned Solomon's temple to the ground. And so Jerusalem has left this kind of this smoking trash heap. And the temple represented God's physical dwelling place with his people. So as long as the temple was there, the people assumed God's presence was, is with us. That's what it represented. And so when the temple was torn down, the Jews were essentially prevented from worshiping God in, their full, in its fullest sense. And so when they come back from exile, the first thing they start doing, it tells us in Ezra and Nehemiah, the first thing they start doing is rebuilding the temple. They've been exiled from worshiping for 70 years, and so here they are back in the land, back in the promised city, and they start rebuilding the temple. That's the very first thing they start doing. They lay the foundations, they lay the, the cornerstone. But then, if you remember Ezra and Nehemiah, the, the, the nearby Samaritans begin to persecute them. Um, Nehemiah has to go out and deal with them, and so work on the temple comes to a, a halt. And from the year that they arrive back, which is about 536 B.C., until Haggai shows up in about 520, which is about 16 years, the temple just stayed undone. The foundation was laid, the cornerstone was laid, but nothing else got done. Nothing else got accomplished. And so Haggai shows up on the scene to essentially call out against these people. About, it's about 50,000, maybe a little more by the time Haggai shows up. These 50,000 Jews who started rebuilding the temple, but have since stopped. They found other things to spend their money on, other things to spend their time on, and restoring right worship just became unimportant. Now, in Jewish life, temple worship was central. It was something you did every day. If you remember, we talked about the main altar outside of the temple was always burning. The smoke was always rising up before the Lord. It was a reminder, a, a two, two-edged reminder. We are sinful and must always repent, and God is faithful to forgive. So it's this constant reminder of that. That, that we're sinful, that God is faithful, that there's a temple, God is present with us, and it was the central thing in Jewish life, but it was gone. And even when they got back, they started rebuilding, they got distracted, and their distractions became their focus. And so Haggai the preacher, the prophet, shows up to call them out about it. Um, there are several things that uh, he deals with in the book. First one, like I was just, just, just talking about, the restoration of the temple. Uh, we see the authoritative word of God, which comes through his messengers, is a huge thing in the book. Uh, God is not um, speaking audibly from the sky, 
although that would be really cool if he would do that sometime. I would love to hear that and just make, you know, you're facing a decision and you need to know what to do and you're like, God, just speak so I can hear you, right? That, you know, and sometimes he does that. You know, it says that when, 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 um, when Jesus was baptized, God spoke. But Haggai is emphasizing, or really God is emphasizing through Haggai, that God's prophets speak with God's authority. And so when Haggai shows up to preach and he says, you're sinning, stop it and turn, it's not Haggai saying it, it's, it's God himself saying it. Which is why the Old Testament ministry of the prophets is where we get the New Testament ministry of the pastor, of the preacher. Those who teach and administrate the word comes back, it, it's, it's based in the Old Testament prophetic ministry. If anybody gets up as a pastor and says, uh, thus says the Lord, A, you ought to take what he says seriously. B, you better verify that thus says the Lord, right? I don't have any authority in and of myself, by myself, to tell you what God says. I can only get up here and say, here's what God says. And then you have the freedom, and I would argue the responsibility, to go and say, is that what God is saying? Like the Bereans do in Acts. They hear, they hear Paul teach the Bible, and they go and search the scriptures diligently to see if what he says is what God has said. And so uh, Haggai emphasizes God's authoritative word through his, through his messengers. Third thing, God's sovereignty is emphasized. Uh, the phrase Lord of hosts, or which really means Lord of armies, is used 14 times in this short little book. He talks about the Lord controlling the fortunes of his people. God will say to the people, the reason y'all aren't getting anything done is because you're being sinful, and I'm keeping you from essentially becoming wealthy, is what he says. Uh, we see that he controls the, force, the fortunes of the nations, that he directs even the, the, the forces and the movements of nature itself. Uh, he motivates people to action, and he establishes and deposes kings, which we've seen all of that too. We see that the people are to work. They're to work physically for the Lord, but also the harder work of repenting, of going inside of our own hearts and saying, where am I sinning against the Lord? Where do I need to turn and follow him? And then lastly, we see a promise of Jesus. And we'll get to that towards the end. But the first thing about investments, poor investments reveal themselves. Long term, sometimes in the short term, poor investments ultimately reveal themselves. Look at uh, Haggai chapter 1, picking up in verse 1. It says, in the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet, to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while the house while this house lies in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of the host, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them in a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why? Declares the Lord of hosts. Because of my house that lies in ruins while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has with, withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on the ground brings, on what the ground brings forth, on man and beast, and on all their labors. So, you know, none of these prophets got a very encouraging message to share with these people. You know, God didn't send them to say, you guys are doing great. And it is my pleasure to be here. You know, these prophets had heavy messages to come and tell the people. 
And one of that, that should remind us that uh, these Jews are a lot like us. You know, we're, sometimes we're tempted to kind of step back and say, I wouldn't do that. I would clearly have rebuilt the temple. And yet, Haggai holds up this mirror that says, hang on, hang on. That looks a, that looks a lot like you. Because we get so easily distracted. I mean, look at, look at what he says in verse 9. You look for much, and behold, it came to little. And you, when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord? Because my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. You ever wondered sometimes why you just can't seem to get ahead? You ever had that feeling? Or you have one of those weeks where everything just goes wrong? We all feel that way. That doesn't necessarily mean God's doing that, by the way. But it is here. And what he's saying is, you, my people, are giving yourselves to things while ignoring me. You're claiming to be godly. You're claiming the name of the people of God. You're living in the place of God while neglecting everything about God. And so he says, I'm, I'm bringing punishment on you for that. And as I said earlier, they'd been there 16 years and they hadn't done anything. They busy themselves not with God's work, but with building themselves fancy houses. That's why he says, is, is, is it the time for you to live in paneled houses? Now, you know, uh, heavy wood paneling had its heyday in our culture, right? That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about fancy, ornate homes. And it's not bad to have a fancy, ornate home. What's bad is that when all of your effort, when all of your uh, intention, when all of your time and resource goes into building yourself a kingdom for yourself and not investing in the eternal things of God, that's when the problem arises. There are plenty of very faithful Christians living in nice homes who rightly worship God. And there are plenty of people who have built a kingdom out of their home and claim to be followers of God while ignoring God. And that's what he's saying here. And so the Lord sends Haggai to rebuke their sinfulness. Now, that's something too we ought to listen to carefully. That God is a rebuking God. God is not passive with our sins. God is not careless with our sins. God rebukes our sins. Sometimes it's really up front and in our face. Sometimes he, we're David and he sends us a Nathan that says, you are the man. But sometimes God's rebuke comes in more subtle ways. Like God said, you brought a home and I did what? I blew it away. <laughs> I, I, I kept your crops from growing. You were cold and so you put on clothes and you still weren't warm. These are all rebukes from God against his people. Even in the New Testament, Paul writes in 2 Timothy 3.16 that the word of God is breathed out from God's mouth and it's useful, among other things, for rebuking. There are times in each of our lives, multiple times, where we need to be rebuked. Not rebuked harshly, but rebuked in love, which is why Matthew, or in, in Matthew 18, Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, go to him. He doesn't say go to him and spit on him or insult him or anything. It says go to him and essentially reason with him. Because we all need to be rebuked at times. And God is a rebuking God because he loves us. Which is why Hebrews says that God disciplines us because he loves us. And that's why he's rebuking these people in Haggai because he loves them. They surrounded themselves with creature comforts while God's house lay in ruin. So essentially get the picture. They're living back in the city. And uh, if you've ever been to Jerusalem, then you can kind of imagine it uh, a little more vividly. But there's a, a hilltop. Jerusalem's built on a mountaintop. And the, the central mountaintop is where the Temple Mount is. And you can kind of see it from these other surrounding mountaintops. And so there on the mountaintop is where the temple was. And then houses would have been all around it. So here are all these fancy paneled houses. And in the middle of it is the burned out ruins of the temple. And for 16 years, they just got comfortable with that. But they were comfortable, not, not only with the, the ruins of God's house, but with their own, with putting everything they had into their own homes. And so, 
I got the question there. Why is the rebuilding of the temple so important? Well, as I said, you know, a, a few moments ago, the temple was the physical dwelling place of God on earth. It represented God's presence with his people. It was a picture of right worship, which means there's wrong worship. God doesn't accept anything that we give him. God cares about how we approach him in prayer. One of my favorite quotes is from uh, an old dead pastor, but he said, uh, before we ever utter a word in prayer, we ought to pause and remember who it is that we're speaking to. We ought to pause and remember 1 John, that we are speaking to the God in whom is no darkness. He is totally light. He is without sin. He is the sovereign who controls all. And sometimes we just rush into his presence in prayer. God, I need this, 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 and this. And we can forget who we are speaking to. You know, if, um, if a, a very esteemed person, a powerful person or a person who has some kind of office comes into our presence, we usually don't run up to them and tell them everything that we need and everything going wrong in our lives, right? A lot of times we just want them to acknowledge us. <laughs> Hey, I'm, hey. But we don't treat God that way a lot of times. We just rush in and start babbling about everything going wrong in our lives, or everything that we want, or everything that we think that we need. But the temple was a picture of right worship, and God had outlined very specifically how his people were to approach them. If you remember uh, the law, Exodus, uh, uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the law is outlined, 613 individual laws, many of them about how people were to approach God, how they were to offer both themselves and which kind of sacrifice and what had to be done to be clean. God cares about how he was to be worshiped. And so the fact that they were just uh, so careless about restoring right worship revealed something about their own hearts. It revealed or excuse me, rebuilding the temple would indicate to the people that right worship was being restored, and yet they neglected it. So uh, you can see there I'm on um, almost at the bottom of page two. When the Babylonians captured Jerusalem, burned the temple to the ground, which is a symbol to the world, God had deposed his people. Now, that may not have been what every nation was thinking. Babylon was probably thinking, hey, we won. They weren't thinking God uh, was on our side in this. You know, uh, everything we know about Nebuchadnezzar, he wasn't a godly man. God moved in his life at times. But the prophets tell us that God uses rulers, both his own rulers and pagan rulers, for his own purposes. And so when Babylon, when King Nebuchadnezzar finally conquered Jerusalem and raised it to the ground, he didn't offer thanks uh, in prayer to God. God, thank you for being on our side in this battle. But the Jews, if they were a people of the word, as they should have been, should have realized it wasn't Nebuchadnezzar who destroyed the temple. It was God who destroyed the temple. Now, how do we know that? Anybody remember where it says that? <laughs> Jeremiah 7. Jeremiah 7, God says, you go out and you live like pagans all throughout the week. You murder, you steal, you lie, you commit adultery, you do all kinds of heinous acts, and then you just run into the temple and you say, ah, we're saved because we're in the temple. And God says, well, I'll tear it down. If you're going to treat my temple like an idol, I will tear it to the ground. And so when, when Nebuchadnezzar comes along and tears it to the ground, what, is, what does the Bible tell us about that? The Bible says, while it happened by Nebuchadnezzar's physical hand, it was God who brought it to the ground. And so when the people failed to rebuild it, they were ultimately saying with their, with their actions, we don't care about rightly worshiping God. We're glad to be back in our hometown, but that satisfies me. So they were saying, I'm not, I'm not concerned with what God would have us do. Rebuilding it would be a signal to the nations that God was keeping his promises to return and restore his people. That's what they should have done. They should have set about rebuilding it and rebuilding it fast to say God is still faithful. Even after 70 years of exile, God is faithful. But they didn't. That tells us something. It tells us that our sin tells a lie to the world about who God is. 
when we sin, when we embrace sin in our lives, we're telling the world a lie about God. That doesn't mean God doesn't keep his word. When the people didn't rebuild the temple, that wasn't proof positive that God failed in his promise. That was proof positive that we tell lies about God to the world. We, we cast um, uh, dishonor upon God's character when we sin. Because the people should have had a, in their heart of hearts a desire to say God is faithful. I want everybody to know, I want the world to know that God is faithful. Let's rebuild the central thing that says God is faithful. But they didn't. They told the world by their actions, my house is more important than God's house. My comfort is more important than, than God's worship. And so when we embrace sin in our lives, we're telling the world a lie about who God is. Telling the world a lie about who God is. But God had promised to restore his people. He'd also promised to exile them, if you remember. In Jeremiah 29, we always often quote Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. But it came, that promise came in the middle of a larger promise. And that larger promise was, I'm sending you into exile. I'm sending you to a place that's not your own, a place where you don't want to go, and I'm going to send you there for 70 years. And then comes verse 11. But I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for your prospering, for your future. Because then he goes on to say, after 70 years, I will regather you. I will restore you. And so God had promised both the exile and the restoration. And here he is keeping his promise by bringing back the people. Even that's a cool story. Because he raised up Babylon to exile the people. And then he raises up uh, the Medes and the Persians to overthrow the Babylonians. So the people get sent back. It's crazy that God's in charge, right? And that he moves in the hearts of men and women. But he moves us to do things to carry out his will. And it's incredible. And so their first priority should have been worshipful obedience in rebuilding the temple. But their actions showed that that was not their priority. So God used a drought, he used economic hardship, and he used a preacher to call their attention to their sins. Their investments had been in themselves, not in God. And it was beginning to show. Well, Haggai tried to make it plain to the Jews, and he's making it plain to us, too. He wants you to know, he wants me to know. It's one of the things that when we read Old Testament prophets like Haggai, that this is not just a a report on what happened thousands of years ago. He's holding up a mirror to us. And he's saying to you and I right now, we are right now investing our lives into something. Our time, our our money, our resources, our emotions, everything. We're investing it into something all the time, every day. Sometimes we're making ongoing investments, like in a retirement account. We we do that as an ongoing way. Sometimes we do it in a a day-by-day thing. We look for some pleasure on Monday to make us feel good. We look for a different pleasure on Tuesday. Or in my family, uh, sometimes they, they, not me, it's among our women folk in my family, but uh, they, they like to celebrate with today prizes. And a today prize can be anything. It can be a cup of coffee or a very expensive pair of boots. And that's okay. That's okay sometimes. But, but when we look for our pleasure in those things and not in God... We're investing ourselves into earthly things that can never satisfy us. It's not wrong to drink coffee. Obviously, I drink a lot of coffee. It's not wrong to to get a coffee or to get a pair of boots or to, to, to do whatever. It is wrong to seek your joy and satisfaction in those things. If you're having a bad day and you're feeling emotionally heavy, or you're feeling anxious and worrisome, and your, your first response is to go get something that numbs the pain and meets another, and makes you feel good, rather than going to God in prayer, then that's a problem. You're investing yourself not in God, you're investing yourself into some fleeting pleasure. That's exactly what they were doing here in Jerusalem. So we invest ourselves and our resources into something, but we gotta ask the question, what, what's the return on our investment? What's it getting us, what's it giving back to us? 
The principle of a financial investment is you invest in, a, in, in an account and over time it grows and so it gives you something. And that's how we ought to think about our lives. What return are we getting in our lives based on what we're investing? What's it getting you? We ought to notice that God does not take disobedience lightly. He's not passive. He doesn't ignore these things. Remember uh, last week we looked at Zephaniah. And in Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 12, God says, I will search Jerusalem with lamps. I will punish the men who are complacent. Those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. There are some people walking around thinking, well, God hadn't punished me yet. He clearly isn't going to punish me. Or God is, you know, if there is a God, he's not going to do anything about this. I've been doing this whatever for so long and God hadn't done anything about it yet. So he must just not care about it. There are people who think like that. I can say that with authority because that's what the Bible says. <laughs> that there were men who said the Lord will, no, will, will not do good nor will he do ill. He doesn't care is what they were saying. And that's what Paul is talking about in Romans 1 when he says uh, when we exchange right worship of God for worship of of creatures and created things, when we start becoming idolaters, it makes us dumb. That's Ben's translation of the Greek in Romans 1, right? It says when we exchange worship of God for worship of things, our foolish hearts are darkened, is what it says. It translates to we become dumb. If you remember, the prophets also said that idolaters look at, look at things like wood and say, well, get up and save me. When the people of God see God and they stand there silently in worship. Or our foolish hearts become dumbed down by idols and we start saying, well, God just doesn't care about this. God doesn't care that I told this little white liar. God doesn't care that I'm indulging in this. Or God doesn't care that I'm looking for satisfaction in a thing rather than in him. And Haggai comes along and says, don't, don't let sin fool you like that. He punishes the people. He didn't punish out of anger. He punishes out of love. He rebukes them out of love. And he fits their punishment with their sinfulness. That's what's interesting. God says, all right, you're trusting in things like clothes to keep you warm and food to fill your bellies and drink to keep you from thirsting. And so what are their punishments? Their punishment, God causes the things that they are looking for satisfaction in to lack satisfaction. God rebukes us just like that. You ever buy something because you felt bad and then you're like, gosh, I shouldn't have spent that money. Or you bought something because you felt bad and you got home and your spouse finds out about it. And then your bad day, which got good for a minute, gets worse. God uses those things in our lives to rebuke us. Not to just squash us under his thumb, but to say, look, I love you enough to tell you you're looking for hope, joy, satisfaction in all the wrong places. And I love you enough to keep the thing that you're seeking satisfaction from, from satisfying you. And sometimes we miss that God rebukes in those ways. In this particular situation... The people were being stingy. They were taking all their money and building their own houses while neglecting God's house. And so God kept them economically poor. He says, because you are loving your money more than right worship of God, I'm going to use your money to punish you. That is a startling statement. <laughs> because we live in a society dominated by money. We live in a society dominated by the love of money and I've got to have money and, and I feel safe when I have money and I feel worried when I don't have money. And God says, oh, well, if you trust in it, then I may use it to, to punish you, to rebuke you, to help you see that only I can save. Only I can satisfy. The problem being revealed here is that we often look for happiness, for life, for blessing and security in places that it can't be found. That's one of the things that Haggai would reveal about us, about our, our sinful humanity. Because our hearts are broken by sin, we tend to look for satisfaction in places where it can't be found. 
or it's like a drug. It gives us a high and then a very low low. And then we keep coming back to it. So Haggai says in verse five of chapter one, verse seven, consider your ways. Give careful thought to how you're living. One pastor says, uh, where does your discretionary money go? If you do your budget and you have some leftover money, where does that go? Have you reduced the amount of discretionary money you have because you spend it on financial pre-commitments? Debt, homes, cars, hobbies, subscriptions, investments, cell phones, vacations, clothes. He says, and what about your discretionary time? What have you committed your schedule to? What can't you do because you've already committed yourself? Now hear me again. None of these things are bad by themselves. But we can strap ourselves to the max financially and time and have nothing left to give the Lord. Nothing. You know, God calls us primarily as New Testament Christians to disciple. And one of the things that when we look into the, to the truths of Scripture is that discipleship takes a long time. Both in the, the, the amount of years that it takes, but also just the amount of any individual given encounter. You can't disciple someone uh, in 30 minutes to an hour. It takes hundreds of hours, years, lifetimes to disciple. And when we pack our schedules with, with other things that prevent us from being able to pour ourselves into each other in meaningful, godly ways, then we're neglecting godly things for n- other things. Things that may not be bad by themselves, but because they detract from the things of God, they become bad. It's not wrong to have a paneled house. It's wrong to have a paneled house and have one because you've neglected God. And so Haggai would have us ask the question, what, what do our investments reveal? He tells us that bad investments should be corrected. Look at chapter 1, verse 12. So after God says all these things, it says, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtel, and, jo- and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. That's refreshing to read. If you ever read through the Old Testament, that one verse is refreshing. Because most of the Old Testament says, God says this, and the people did the other thing. But it says, finally, they obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, and the words of Haggai the prophet, and the Lord their God, that the Lord their God had said to them, the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai the messenger of the Lord spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. This is what the Bible calls repentance. That word is used a lot when we share the gospel, repent and turn to God, repent of your sins and turn to God. Here we see repentance played out. We see the, the two sides of repentance. I recognize my sin and I, and I do something about my sin. And the people here heard the word of God. Their eyes were open to their sin and they agreed with God about it. That's wrong. What I've been doing is wrong. How I have been living is wrong and I need to change. And so you can see there are three aspects of their repentance. The first one is the action of repentance. They were disobeying, and they began to obey. It says in verse 12, they heard uh, what God said, and they obeyed. It says in verse 14, too, they started to build the house. Their motivation for repentance, in verse 12, was fear of the Lord. Not being scared of Him, but being in awe of Him, of recognizing who He is. Of recognizing that he is the one in charge. That he is the one who brought us out of exile. That he is the one who gives me life. That's what the Bible says. That God, uh, Colossians 1.17. That Jesus is before all things and in him all things are holding together. That's everything from the sun coming up to our lungs pumping. He makes it all happen. And when we recognize that, we stand in awe. We stand in fear. And then the cause of their repentance is that the Lord brought it about. 
verse 14, it says that the Lord stirred up both the spirit of Zerubbabel and the spirit of all of the remnant of the people. This, 50, this group of 50,000, the remnant of what was, says that the Holy Spirit stirred them up. He did something in them that brought out repentance. And that's a biblical uh, theological point that we need to see. We don't just come to repent on our own. We don't decide on our own, oh, oh yeah, what I'm doing is wrong, I need to repent. Because the Bible tells us that our hearts are too far gone in our sin for that. Romans 3 tells us that um, no one does good, no, not one. No one seeks for God. John 3, verse 19, Jesus said that when he came into the world, men preferred the darkness. Our preference is always sin. And so if I'm going to move towards God, it's got to be God doing it. Ephesians 2, but you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Verse 4, but God made you alive together with Christ. So God is active in the repentance of his people. When you come to the point where you see that you are sinful, either the initial, your initial conversion experience or just a natural part of your Christian life that you see I'm in sin and I need to to repent and turn away, you can be assured that God is keeping the promise he made to them here in verse 13. He is with us. He's doing that work in us. He's exposing our sin and calling us to righteousness. And so what we see is that these people found a far more worthwhile investment than building their own homes, building their own kingdoms. They began to invest in the things of God. And we need to give serious thought to this because a lot of us invest a lot in our own selves. A lot of us invest a lot in our own lives. And if all of your time, money, effort, energy, if all of it goes to building your earthly kingdom, All you're doing is building a grandiose sandcastle while the tide is out. That's it. It's like trying to to build your life's hope and dreams on a sandcastle while the tide is out. Because what's going to happen in just a few hours? It's going to go away. And that's what these people were doing. And yet God brings it to their attention and they repent. Let me speed through these last. I always run out of time just too much in the Bible. Sound investments prove themselves in their returns. God promises physical blessing to his people when they obey. He promises that he will give them an abundance. He will, he will provide for their needs. This is all the way back to Deuteronomy uh, 30 or 31. I can't remember. I thought my head. When God tells them, I'm putting before you today a choice, life and death. If you obey, things will go well. You'll dwell secure in the land. If you disobey, you'll be exiled and thrown out. And he says, therefore, choose life that it might go well. And what did they choose? They chose death, and so God threw them out. It's almost like a repeat of the garden, right? God sets before Adam and Eve a choice. Obey, and things will go really well. All your needs will be met. I'll come walk with you in the evening. Disobey and you'll be cast out. And what did they do? They got cast out. And do you know that that's the story of the whole Bible? This is not in your notes. This is just in my head. You know, that's the story of the whole Bible. God says, do this. We fail and we fall into the consequence of our sin. It's the story of the whole Bible until somebody shows up. Until somebody who is instructed by God obey. And he obeyed. And now we have life. That's the story of the Bible. God said, obey. We can't. Jesus does life for those who trust in him. Which is really where the book closes. I'm going to skip over quite a bit. Verse 20. Help if I turn my page. It says, the word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I'm about to shake the heavens and the earth, to overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I'm about to destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations and overthrow the chariots and the riders and the horses and their riders shall go down, every one of them by the sword of his brother. 
On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtel, declares the Lord, and make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. You see, this is, if, 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 you're, not a, if you're not reading carefully, you'll, you'll skip right over this, but this is God saying, um, don't forget, I made a promise to send you Jesus, and I'm keeping my promise. Because you see, back in Samuel, in 2 Samuel 7, if you remember, God makes a promise to David. He says to David, I'm going to establish your throne forever. There's going to be one of your sons that comes along and sits and rules over Israel forever. And he'll be perfect forever. Solomon comes along and fails. Every son of David and Solomon comes along and fails. And at the end of the historical books, when the nation is being carted off into exile, we're almost left asking, well, where's the promised king? And yet here, God says to Zerubbabel, I'm going to make you like a signet ring. Now, the, the, where this all comes together is understanding what God is saying. The signet ring of a king is like his, his royal, um, uh, it's a special ring that says I'm the king, essentially. And uh, to call someone my signet ring is to say, you are my chosen one. Now, Zerubbabel, historically, is the grandson of Jehoiakim, one of the evil kings over Judah. And God says to Jehoiakim in Jeremiah 22, I will strip you from being my signet ring. You have been, and for your wickedness, you are no longer. So it's essentially God saying, I gave you this ring, but give it back. And then here comes Zerubbabel, grandson of Jehoiakim, and God says to him, I'm giving you the signet ring. The promise stands. There's hope. And so when we turn to the very first page of the New Testament, and we read that there's a genealogy there that many of us skip over because he wants to read a bunch of names. The very first page of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1, verse 13. Zerubbabel. There he is. In the lineage of Jesus Christ is this man, the signet ring of God, shows that the promise stands because in verse 18 of Matthew chapter 1, we read, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. And then in verse 21, she will bear a son and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. See, even when we fail God, God does not fail us. Even when we break promises, even when we devote ourselves to things that we all not devote ourselves to devote ourselves to, God comes along and rebukes us in kindness and points us to the fact that the promise still stands. So the, the, the question is, in light of the fact that God is a covenant-keeping, promise-keeping, saving God, the question then is, what do our lives reveal about that? Am I investing in that? Are my, 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 my financial resources going to that? My time going to that? My, my energy is going to God? Or am I acting like the Jews who grew content living around the ruins of God? Am I content to let right worship go unaddressed while I just invest everything into myself? I had some other things I was going to say, but time got me again. But it's important to know that God's faithful to his promises. He would restore and rescue his people. He would do it through his own son, Jesus Christ. And that's why we have hope. That's why we can look out at a chaotic world in 2020. It's been a fairly terrible year. I mean, we can just all agree with that. We ran out of toilet paper, for goodness sake. And we can say, uh, God is a covenant-keeping, promise-keeping God who saves. And I can 
build my life on that. I can't build my life on politics. I can't build my life on the economy. I can't build my life on the stability of this country. Build my life on the things of God. And so Haggai, as a friend, as a prophet, comes along and throws his arm around us and says, what does what your life say about that, friend? What does your life say about that? Are you investing in true things or fake things? Let me pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that you speak so faithfully to us when it is open. We thank you, Lord, that you take it and hide it in our heart and speak to us even when it's not open. Father, we thank you for the life and the ministry of Haggai, who spoke then and who is speaking now by your sovereign power. Father, I pray that you would send the Holy Spirit to come and search us out, as the psalmist said, search me and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the paths of righteousness. Father, we want to give ourselves to making eternal investments. There's nothing wrong with living in the world. There's nothing wrong, Lord, with having money and buying things, but there is something terribly wrong about trusting and loving the world and neglecting you. Father, we don't want to be a people who invest in sandcastles while, while the tide is out. We want to build our house upon the rock. Father, we stand in awe that you are a covenant-keeping, promise-keeping God, who even when things seem most dark, the light of the hope of Jesus Christ still shines. Jars of clay to show that the power is not ours, the power is yours. Father, thank you for time together in your word. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.